Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I learned that Obion County was created on October 24th, 1823, and it took its name from the Obion River. And you can learn more about it in our regional history gallery. So today we're going to chat with researcher and writer Bill Carey, who co-founded Tennessee History for Kids in November 2004. He's also worked as a journalist and an author and writes a monthly history column for Tennessee Magazine. So this is going to be a lot of fun, especially for those of you like me who have a passion for history. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about where you came from. Where, where, where'd you grow up? You know, what inspired this love of history? Well, I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama, and I went to college in Nashville, went away for five years to, to do the Navy thing, and then came back and became eventually a reporter around 1993. And I did that for about five years. And somewhere during that time period, I worked for originally the Tennessean, but then I switched newspapers between 98 and 2002 uh, several times. But eventually my specialty became um, articles about history and, and just articles that always had a historic thing at the end or something. It just became, I, I became very interested in it. And, uh, and, and I left the Tennessean to do a book on Nashville history called Fortunes, Fiddles, and Fried Chicken, which is a book about Nashville business history that came out in the year 2000, and it was a real local hit. Uh, it, but it's a, it's a book that has like a chapter on the, on the National Life and Accident Insurance Company, a chapter on Genesco, a chapter on the mini pearl fried chicken scandal of 1969. And this book, here we are 20 years later, I, I delivered 10 of them to Parnassus yesterday. They, they still sell this book. It's a, uh, but that kind of shifted me from newspapers to, to history. And then I started Tennessee History for Kids around 2004, mainly because public school teachers told me that they needed something to teach Tennessee history with. Now, you, um, because you're a journalist, like you talk in the pyramid, so we hit all the big, important things right here off the front. Now we're going to break it apart, and I'm going to dive in a little bit because I'm fascinated by your career and what, you, what you've been doing. Um, start off with the history. When you were younger, was, did you have a passion for history as, as a young boy, or did that come later? I don't think so. Uh, I grew up uh, in middle-class Huntsville. My dad worked for NASA. We, had, uh, we spent a lot of our time on, on, a, on a lake in northeast Alabama, and it never even occurred to me that that lake is on someone's farm, that, they, that somebody had lived in that, on that farm as recently as one generation ago. Uh, so I, it, it didn't ha- I didn't have that much interest in it. And then I, I had a couple of good high school teachers, a couple of good college teachers, but I didn't even major in history. I majored in math and Russian, oh. actually. And so, so it kind of came later. It doesn't matter when it comes, when, when the interest comes, but it may, maybe it's just as well that I didn't major in history because I don't write in a scholarly method. And some people have said that's a good thing. So you, you majored in math rather than journalism. Um, what what uh, got you out of uh, the math area and into writing for newspapers and magazines? I don't know, but I sometimes when I'm driving along, I'll think about like how my career went during those few years immediately after I got out of the Navy. And to be honest, it, it's, it's not, it's kind of painful because I think back at all the different paths I tried to take that failed. And, um, but before I forget, let me tell you a discovery park of America story. I've been there about five times. Uh, it was there that I discovered Kiva planks, which we have here at my house. Um, but it was also there. I was in the tower and I looked around and I saw a Naval, I saw a Naval aircraft suspended in the air and I thought, my God, that looks familiar. 
And I went down and looked at, and as I was, I, I, I knew it looked familiar to me. Well, it turns out it's the exact one that I drove by for one year when I was at flight school in Pensacola. And I knew, and I, I have a feeling not very many of the people who see it went to flight school in Pensacola when it was hang, when it was suspended in the air. And I have no, where do you guys get these things? You know How do you what, find from, out that the Navy's getting rid of this? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, there is a distribution list that you can get on for things like that. But, but uh, this was one of the things that Mr. Kirkland wanted. And, you know, when Discovery Park first started, a lot of people from the community came together and helped him. And he just put them all on the road and they went to auctions and, uh, you know, bid on things and, and asked and searched. And then word got out and pretty soon offers started coming in. So, yeah, it's one of our more uh, interesting artifacts that people see and a lot of times people are people walk by and they're like well that's not real and then somebody says wait a minute that is real so yeah a lot of artifacts like that here yeah well so, so there's a list so you're saying if i had out if i was on the list and an outbid if this thing could be in my backyard now it could be yes there's okay, a lot of stipulations and they come each year and and look at it to make sure that it's because it that one is alone and they look to make sure that it's attached right and that it's you know being taken well care of and yeah um, that particular one but you know things like our titan missile you know that was actually purchased so um but yeah no that's really interesting and and we're going to talk a little bit more in a minute about the stuff that you do here with education um Talk a little bit about journalism. Did you enjoy uh, – you, you were working in journalism <clears throat> in a particularly interesting phase, you know, an, an era, you know, as things were changing pretty rapidly. Um, did you enjoy working as a journalist? I don't think there's any doubt that I gained a lot from it. Uh, I, there were certainly times when I was doing it that I didn't enjoy it per se. Gannett, who owns the Tennessee and probably wasn't a good fit for me. Uh, it's a USA Today product, and now they've and they've gone ahead and bought every other newspaper. But I was always sort of digging up the hard hitting stories that might be a little longer, and they wanted me to do a nice, fluffy front page story about this, that, and the other. We had a lot of arguments. I remember repeatedly. I just I, just the other day I was recounting one on Facebook where I was ordered to do a story about a brand new theme park that was going to be built in suburban Nashville. And I made two phone calls and concluded that there's no way this thing is ever going to be built. And I refused to do it. And they insisted I do it. And I walked off the job and went home and they called me and threatened to fire me and went back and forth. And I eventually gave in and did the story. And of course it was never built. It was one of, I think eight theme parks, for example, <laughs> because I saw this the other day, there was a story in, in the local media about a new theme park in Nashville. And I remember thinking, oh, I've been there before, the poor reporter. Uh, I covered business for three years. I covered the mayor's office a lot. Um, and then I covered the Tennessee General Assembly for about two sessions, or two, two years. And that all, I, I was able to get a lot of, I, I gained a lot from everyone, every, all, all, all the different phases I did. I met a lot of people. When you're a reporter, it's kind of neat because you meet everybody. That doesn't mean they like you as a friend, but they, but so, so now when I go to events, I, I know, I know that guy over there, I know the important person in the room, but, but, uh, but it was very helpful and it's been helpful to Tennessee history for kids as well. What, what was the first, if you remember the, the very first, uh, history story that you wrote that sort of lit the fuse? I don't remember, but I know that, um, th I did a lot of stories about, about a part of downtown Nashville that was kind of neglected and kind of had potential. It was called Lower Broadway of Second Avenue. And that was really beginning to go from a place you could take your car down and park and get, get a hardware part or get your dog flea, uh, a flea collar to, um, to what it eventually became. And I hate it. And don't, don't get me wrong. I can't, I, I can't stand it now, but, but, um, but it was all happening. I, I was covering the hard rock cafe and the, the creation of the Wild Horse Saloon and the new Country Music Hall of Fame and the new arena, which at that which is no longer the new arena. But I, I covered all those big things that meant the new library. And um, and uh, and so I remember that all very well. But that now it feels like ancient history. Obviously, I woke up on Christmas Day and saw that a bomb had gone off and killed and destroyed several of those buildings and. Uh, a lot of care went into all that, I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry to sorry to tell you about the bomb, of course. But so, what? Where along in your story did you start to see a need for more history um, amongst um, the school systems? 
after Fortune's Fiddles came out, I spoke to all the Rotary clubs and and it, it I kind of became this history thing, history guru. And I was asked to be a I was asked to be a judge at a history fair at Bellevue Middle School. And I went and while I was there, I started looking through the library stacks and I was kind of disappointed about I, I, well, I know what it was. I was looking for my own book. I remember this. I was looking for my own book on the library stacks. I didn't have one, which, which offended me no, no end. And, um, and anyway, but I came to find through that process that I, I had the idea of doing a book on Nashville history for students. And I, and I took that idea to one of the big foundations. And I'll never forget the answer. It's from Dr. Friss Jr., who's still very much alive here in Nashville. And he said, Bill, before you do that, he said, I'll help, but you've got to get the school system to promise up front that they'll use them because I'm not, I don't want a warehouse full of books. And that answer disappointed me, but it was a very wise answer. I then went to the school system and basically found that they needed help teaching Tennessee history. And that's what led me to start the internet website called Tennessee History for Kids. The website thing, remember, I didn't mention this, but I had started an internet newspaper called NashvillePost.com. Uh, in about 2002. And so we, I had done that. And so, um, so I just kind of combined the ideas and started a online um, um, website for in, like for third grade teachers, click here, fourth grade teachers, click here. And, and, and that's kind of how all that got started. Now we're talking about 2004, 2005. And w- was the um, response immediate? Did you, did you realize you were filling a need right, right off the bat? I realized I was filling a need. It was not easy to, to make it work any more than it's easy to make Wikipedia work financially. Uh, it's a very long story as to how I got to where I was today, but I was able to kind of uh, leverage and create a thing that had some support from the government, some from private sector. You can relate to this. Um, and some, but the biggest turning point was when I started doing little booklets, which are they're not, they're not the cost of textbooks. They're little $2 booklets that public school teachers use. And they're not just booklets about whatever I want to write about. What I've done is I've researched in great detail the social study standards. And if, and, 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 and I, uh, if, if there's something that's mentioned in the social study standards that they have to cover in fifth grade, that's something I will cover in a, in a fifth grade booklet that we do. We now have a first grade booklet, a second, two thirds, two fourths, Three fifths, one eighth, and one eleventh. And the reason we've done we do these in the years that we've done them is these are the years that cover U.S. and Tennessee history. We don't do a sixth grade booklet because that's ancient world history, and I don't hold myself up to be the expert on Egyptian culture. And and so, um, but we get a lot of orders from a lot of school systems and some teachers, and and of course the odd homeschooler who will order two. Um, but that's kind of, that's where most of our revenue has come from during the last 16 years. And, and do you think just in general, there are opportunities for improvement in the way history is taught, um, in schools? Absolutely. Uh, there are some, do remember that there's a lot of teachers and so they range from unbelievably talented, devoted people to brand new people who are new at what they do and new to Tennessee. And so uh, we, we try to help them with the website, with the booklets. Uh, we do things like we did a we do a poster every year. The last one we did featured all the courthouses in Tennessee, and um, uh, we did trading cards. But the the other big thing we do and and uh, is is we do a uh, we do a lot of in services, which are basically all day teacher trainings. And do you want to talk about the one we're about to do at Discovery Park? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd love to. And here's why because. It is, it is at a late, late enough date that if other people that are not teachers would like to sign up and register to come, they're welcome to. We're having one at Discovery Park of America on July 23rd. It is one of our six events, and you can see it on our website, which is tnhistoryforkids.org. This is the 5th of 6th, and the one we're having at Discovery Park kind of has a focus on the Mississippi River. We're having presentations on the history of the river, the, the tragedy of Fort Pillow, the tragedy of the Sultana, the, the Sultana tragedy, and Jerry Potter, a author and history buff in Memphis who has researched this his whole life, is going to talk on the Sultana. Uh, and we have a chapter, uh, a, a presentation on the 20-year pro- the process whereupon 
West Tennessee went from being Chickasaw land to having towns and county seats and courthouses and everything. And it, had, it was like a land rush. And then we're going to spend about three year, three hours uh, touring Discovery Park. And that's, and that's an all day thing. And it only costs $40 and it includes lunch and includes admission to Discovery Park and, and any, any costs that we have to take. So it's, it's not a $200 event. It's a $40 event. And we're, we're, we're welcome to, we welcome in the general public, which means we're welcoming homeschool parents, anybody that would like to come. Yeah, it's, it's great. I've been to some of these and there you, you, you do similar things around the state and they're always popular and always, um, both a lot of fun, but also educational. And I always learn a lot. And then of course, this one, you get to tour Discovery Park of America as well. So you can't beat that. We're having six of them. And the first is in Oak, we're going from Oak Ridge, uh, the first day, it's on the Manhattan Project, obviously. Then we're doing one at the Museum of Appalachia across the county in Anderson County, and that's on early Tennessee history. The third one is at Lookout Mountain slash the new Medal of Honor History Center in, De- in Chattanooga, and it's on the Civil War. The fourth one is at the Hermitage, and it's on Andrew Jackson in the early 1800s. You have the fifth one, and then the last one is in Memphis on the 27th. And on the 28th, I will rest. <laughs> well, you, you definitely, with Tennessee history, you have a rich canon within with which end to work. And I want to talk about your three favorite uh, Tennessee historic moments in a minute. But first, before we go to break, I want to hear a little bit more about Runaways, Cobbles, and Fancy Girls, your book that you published in 2018. Well, I've done books before, and... Um, which were varying degrees of successful or unsuccessful. And, and I really didn't intend to do any more hardback books. I've written a column for Tennessee magazine for the last 16 years or something. And I'm, I'm always, it's the one that the electric co-ops produce. I'm always looking for new material because after you do a monthly column for a few years, you kind of need new stuff. Well, I went to the state library several years ago and I thought I would do a column about the very first issue of the Knoxville Gazette, which was the first newspaper printed in Tennessee. I was just going to do an issue and uh, do a column about it. And it was, it was intended originally to be a kind of a funny thing. This is what they were selling and this is what the news was. But instead, what I noticed right off the bat is that I think there were three slave related ads in a four page newspaper. And that struck me as odd because you don't normally think about slavery in Tennessee in 1791, but there was a runaway slave ad in a place now known as Blunt County, and and uh, so anyway, I started looking and I and I, I started looking through all the issues and found other ads. And then I became very interested in this because the truth of the matter is, at that time, all the Tennessee history books ever written almost never say anything about this. And I, and I say this because I've got shelves and shelves. I probably have as good a collection as anyone in Nashville outside of Elder's Bookstore. OK, and so I became fascinated with what was in the ads. I eventually documented and made copies of 906 runaway slave ads printed, separate ads printed in Tennessee from 1791 to 1865. Most of them ran between five and 12 times in the newspaper. So this was a major source of revenue for the newspapers. But then I started digging up other types of ads, ads involving slave auctions and purchased by the Chancery Court click and master. And and it it just kept going on. And I've some of the discoveries I made along the way were kind of eye-opening and for, for people of this generation, very new, very, very newsworthy. Like you might, people probably knew this in the 1870s, but they don't know it now about how banks, banks were all connected to the slave industry. Whenever you see a auction, there would be the name of the bank at the bottom. And he would sometimes even tell you the interest rate. I mean, it was just really, so I ended up doing this book and it came out a couple of years ago. Uh, I self-published the book, which may have been a mistake, but it's gotten a lot of critical acclaim, and um, and and it it just happens. It's by complete coincidence, really. But there's been a lot more interest in this topic during the last two years because of other things. But I will tell you that the same thing that led to my research has led to the other things, and that is the digitization of newspapers. You used to have to go to the state library and look up every one. And now there are things, most notably newspapers.com, where you can just instantaneously pull stuff down. And because of it, every history book on the shelves is going to have to be reexamined because we know so much more now about primary sources 
at the time than we than we did when these books were written. Um, when we come back from the break, I'm going to ask Bill about his favorite three Tennessee history moments. Uh, but for now, let's hear a little bit from our friend Emily. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Bill Carey. I'm excited to hear Bill's top three Tennessee history moments. Well, first of all, let me, let me, uh, let me slightly change the question because I don't want to, I don't want people to think I'm a, I'm a sick person for having this list of my top three, but <laughs> let me just tell you three things that could easily, all three of them individually make rotary club speeches that are just most of them not fully understood or even known by most people in this era. One is the Nickajack expedition. Now this is, when I say this, this many people would view this as a slaughter. Okay. Our wounded Tennessee's wounded knee massacre. But I'll, I have a question because you know a lot about, have you ever heard of the Nickajack expedition? You no, probably have. I have okay. not. Before Tennessee would not have become a state in 1796 it had it not been for the Nickajack expedition. There was a, a, uh, a, a group of warlike Native Americans, which consisted of Cherokee, Creek, a few British deserters, some French traders that lived in the area that is now like the Chattanooga, Tennessee area. They became known as the Chickamaugans, and they were conducting raids on middle and what is now middle and east Tennessee over about a 10-year period. And it was it was kind of guerrilla warfare, and it involved horrible stories. And, 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 and the stories went both directions. There were, it was, it was an era of absolute atrocities, which used to be part of what Tennessee students were taught. And they've kind of scratched it from the history books. I refer to it as, as the war of, as the uh, undeclared war of 1775 to 1795. It largely ended uh, when a scout known as Joseph Brown led an, a volunteer army from Nashville to a place called Nickajack and the Chickamaugans had a village there called Nickajack. They didn't know it was coming. We have about 17 primary sources of what happened, but it's pretty much a slaughter, and, and they were wiped out. And that was kind of the, the – from that point onward, it was, it was pretty safe to travel along that river. It, you have to realize this was a choke point. You couldn't get to Middle Tennessee without taking this river. And it's almost like it never happened. There's – there's hardly a history. First of all, the cave, which is in, which was behind the village, was flooded by TVA. And second of all, it's not even a historic site. It's a T- TWRA property now, but it's completely forgotten and neglected and covered in litter, I'm sorry to say, the area around it. And, and yet it was huge, hugely important when it happened. So that's, that's one of the, one of them. And one thing there that you mentioned that really, you know, is interesting to a lot of people around the country that wouldn't know this, uh, TVA flooded, you know, some some pretty big cities that, you know, theoretically you can stand on the edge and look at the lake and know that there's a whole, you know, city down under the water. You know, of course, it's all gone now, but um, that's that's sort of an interesting part of uh, Tennessee history. Okay, number well, the two. Nickajack expedition, the Nickajack expedition has some weird footnotes. One of them is that of all people— Johnny Cash knew all about Nick Jack. He was a history buff. And during his drug addiction days, he decided he read in an article about TVA about to flood this, this cave. This, this happened in the later part of TVA's era, the sixties. He decided to kill himself and he went into Nick Jack cave and laid down intending to die and instead became a Christian and then got up and found his way out of the cave. This is in his autobiography. But so he knew all about Nickajack. So I, how he knew all about it, I don't know. But I guess, I guess they taught it more in rural Arkansas when he grew up than they do in Tennessee today. So, but there's all sorts of weird footnotes. It's one of the most amazing places in Tennessee, in, in Tennessee. But it's something we don't even know about and don't acknowledge. I, they really need to do something. That sounds like a book. It, it is a book, but I'm not going to write it because my last book flopped miserably. So. Uh, <laughs> at least financially. Scopes Trial Museum. The second thing I was going to mention is 
we do recognize the words, the Scopes trial, but there's a couple of things about it. First of all, so many of us will see the movie Inherit the Wind. That movie is absolutely fictional. That movie is more about the, is more about the McCarthy era than it was about what happened. But if you read the um, autobiography of Mr. Scopes, he describes it in some detail what happened, but but it, it, the difference between what's in the movie and what really happened is, is just so funny. It was very friendly in the movie. They, basically, the town decided that they wanted to have wanted to go ahead and have this here as a publicity stunt in the town of Dayton. And Mr. Scopes was playing tennis one day. He was like a 24-year-old substitute teacher at the school. He was more of a coach than he was a teacher. And they brought him in, all the gentlemen of the town and the leaders, and they asked him if he would do this. And he goes, okay, I'll do it. And he and went back to playing tennis. That was how this all, all started. And, uh, and, and yet, obviously, the name Scopes is more associated. I mean, it's called the trial of the century. I'm not sure if it deserves that, but that's. And, uh, and then the third thing, and again, I'm sorry, but the, the third thing absolutely could be a movie. And I have a question. Have you ever heard of the name Roddy Edmonds? No. You may have. I have not. It came, this story came to light. It's a World War II story involving a man from Knoxville, Tennessee, who went to Knoxville High School. And he was uh, he managed to somehow not be in the throes of, of combat until the very end of the war, but he was captured at the Battle of the Bulge along with thousands of other Americans in one of the worst days of the, of the, Ameri- of the World War II. He, he was sent to an enlisted prisoner war camp. As it turns out, he was the senior enlisted man of 1,200 people. And he was this high school graduate from Knoxville and who he would obviously had limited training as a high school graduate of Knoxville. But on the second or third night, the Nazis, the Nazi commander informed him that the next day, all the Jewish, that they wanted all the Jewish prisoners to fall out. And Roddy Edmonds didn't know. I mean, this is before a lot of the horrors of the Holocaust had come out, but somehow he knew that that was wrong. And the next morning when, when all the Jews were supposed to fall out, Roddy Edmonds had every single prisoner fall out and stand and the commander the the nazi commander came out and said you must you must have misunderstood i just want the jews and roddy edmund said we are all jews and the, the commander got got really angry pulled out his handgun held his revolver to roddy edmund's head and said we just want the jews and he said we are all jews here and apparently he got and then edmunds went on to point out that if you shoot me, you will be shot after the war as a war prisoner uh, for war crimes. And the, and the commander just stormed away. Uh, some version of this story is absolutely true. But it, the, the most amazing thing about it is that he didn't say anything at the time. He wrote it in his diary. And his son discovered this story in 1985 after he had died. After his son read the story, he then went and researched and found other people at the prisoner camp, including other Jews, who absolutely verified that it was true. So the story really was true. There were people who were alive in the late 1980s who were alive because of this guy from Knoxville, Tennessee, who refused to let the Jews be segregated. And why is the story not in the social studies standards? I mean, seriously. I mean, this to me, this guy belongs in the social studies standards. And, and uh uh, probably more than some of the war heroes that we talk about. But, but again, the thing that just amazes me to realize he went to Knoxville High School in the 1930s. He would have gone to an all-wide high school. He wouldn't have gone to any racial sensitivity training. He wouldn't have probably known any Jews. And yet he knew when that Nazi commander held a gun to his head that you're not going to break us apart. So, And what, what's so interesting about that story, too, is it really drives home research and his son who you know saw this little seed there and then you know went out and tried to find more information and tried to bring history to life you know and now you've shared it with all of our listeners and so that really is the importance of history education and continuing to bring that kind of information to light um thank you so much for joining us this is you're welcome this is, this is a blast <laughs> Um, I look forward to seeing you uh, here in a couple of weeks. I look forward to it, and uh, and wish me luck because I'm off to Boy Scout camp. I may not survive. <laughs> yeah, I like the Boy Scout shirt you have on. Yeah, thank you very much. 
Thanks to all of you listeners who've joined Bill, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Thank you.